Well, it's a pleasure and honor to be with you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I feel particularly honored given the extensive work the University of Texas has done in contributing not just to the American knowledge about autism, but to the world knowledge about autism. So it's the great, uh, great alacrity that I accepted the invitation to come. I thank you so much for that. And already this morning has been very rich in some of the discussions and I'm looking forward to our discussions this afternoon. I've chosen as my title, changing perspectives on early intervention. Now I'm using the word changing in two senses. I want to try and describe to you how I perceive the way in which we think about disabilities has changed in the recent past and what that means moving forward. But then equally, it's a verb that means, are you changing your perceptions of disability? So it's also a challenge to us around not only the description, but also how it affects us and our understanding. And if there's one catchphrase that I want you to take away from my presentation, it's simply summed up in this uh, acronym, thinking globally to act locally. Thinking globally to act locally. And by globally, I don't just mean in terms of geographical globe, although that's an important dimension to how we consider a condition such as autism, that it is not particular to any one country, culture or nation. It is an international phenomenon. And therefore our learning or expertise should have applicability beyond the local to the global. But it's global also in the sense of when you are working with a specific child in a specific context, you also need to take some perception of the, global, the globalness of their experience. It's not just in your clinic setting, in your classroom. They have a life beyond that, as indeed you have a life beyond it too. So we need to be thinking globally as well as particularly or locally. But with that in mind, I think we've got a great inheritance to draw upon of what the human mind and energy can create. Because if you were living, what, 50 years or more ago, you would have been living in a world in which diseases such as polio, for example, would have been quite rife. I suppose this slide is where the polio was uh, prevalent in 1987. And you can see that in North America, there was very little polio because red represents how much uh, the world was suffering from the polio epidemics. Remember, polio was a viral infection that caused great uh, upset to the uh, musculature and the nervous uh, capacity. And indeed, one of my best friends growing up was a child who had polio and, as a, a baby and was using calipers. We didn't think that much of it, but there certainly didn't seem to be any cure. And indeed, there hasn't been a cure per se. It was all done on a preventative basis. So there's a big lesson for us right from the beginning. You can change the world, but you have to change it maybe from a preventative perspective rather than from a curative perspective. If you look at where polio is today, in, well, 2017 is this data, you can see that it's almost been eradicated. The green area now shows countries where there is no polio at all, and there's only two areas of redness, which marks where polio has contracted to no longer being a particular condition. So when human beings put their mind to it, they can do world changing things in the world in the context of developmental disabilities. And in this instance, a physical impairment or disease such as polio. So what does that say about autism? Well, here's the spread, as far as we know, in autism in 2017, based on the reported prevalence rates that was available from many different countries. The darker areas, uh, going through green into uh, yellow actually means no data available. But you can see how in Canada, the rates and the prevalence rates there and the prevalence rates in the Nordic countries often higher and in European countries um, than in other parts of the world. So can we change the map of autism in terms of another 30 years? What would it look like? Not just in terms of its prevalence, but its impact on people's lives. 
And if we were to say, well, maybe many more people with autism are part of just that human condition, and it's the diversity of humanity, but the quality of their lives, for example, if we use that as an indicator, then, well, it could well be that that's not much different from what the quality of life is around the globe. Well, that's the challenge that uh, faces us, but it's an altogether different challenge, I think, to when you're dealing with an impairment condition such as polio, because our whole perspective on autism has changed in the recent past with DSM and ICD definitions evolving as our knowledge base and our experience of this condition accumulates more and more knowledge and wisdom. So, in fact, we have yet to settle on what will be the, the defining features of autism because they have been evolving in our developments and in our understanding. And I suspect they will continue to do. And in fact, part of my message to you is that I think it does need to change in the way that we've changed our perceptions on, for example, intellectual disability. And autism has in some extent in my country at least been stuck as a medically diagnosed condition which is not possibly the most fruitful way of looking at the challenges that it faces to the individuals and to their family carers. So I want to propose to you that there's four dimensions in which we might, might need to think about at changing our perspective so that we move away from a focus on impairments to a focus on disadvantage. We move from a charitable notion to one that's based on rights. We stop trying to segregate people and try to create a more inclusive uh, approach. And that in, as an addition to what we do locally, we have to inform ourselves from the national and indeed the global perspectives. So let's look at each of those in turn, beginning with that dimension of impairments. Well, as you probably well know, we no longer see disability, whatever that disability is, solely in terms of any uh, biological or bodily impairment. Yes, it is still part of the definition. And while we may still be researching the genetic basis of autism and putting millions of dollars, pounds and euros into trying to identify some of the causes the biological causes of autism, it is by no means now the, the defining characteristic of disability. Rather, we've moved towards a biopsychosocial model in which we see disability as a confluence of those different dimensions. So there's a psychological dimension to disability in terms of how people think and act in terms of their understandings but also the social influences that also impact on people's disability. And that gets reified in the World Health Organization International Classification of Functioning. This is where you look at a person in terms of their levels of functioning within those, four, those three domains. And your assessment, if you like, of what the person's needs are and what influences their functioning within society has to be assessed against those three different domains. So immediately we move away from a narrow focus on what might be the uh, label, the diagnostic label you're giving the person, which is one feature of what your assessment processes might be. But once you move into some form of intervention, you have then to take a rather broader approach in which the psychological and social factors may well be much more influential in terms of how that person functions within the family, within the community and within wider society. And under those social headings, we're aware of two factors that seem to impact particularly. So poverty is a big determinator of how people function and the quality of life they have. So when you do large samples of people with disabilities or impairments, or you do it on a longitudinal basis, and then you do your statistical analysis that looks to see what are the influences that really affect people's levels of functioning, you discover that often the impairment per se is not the main determinator of functioning, but it can be issues such as poverty that has a big influence 
as to how that person's functions within their society. And the other thing we're beginning to appreciate more as more research gets done globally into autism is how in ethnicity also influences the way people perceive disability to affect people's lives. And different cultures may value different aspects. So if you come, as I do, from a white Irish British background and from my particular culture, there are things we value in child development and in parenting that may not be shared with other cultures. And if we ignore that, then we're not helping the child or the family to function optimally. So part of the change then that we have to uh, be looking for is a broader global perspective on what life and life functioning is like for the individual child. And because the child is such uh, in harmony, if you like, with the family, you have a double client group, if you like, both the child level of functioning and the family's caregiver level of functioning needs to come into account. And certainly it was an American psychologist, Edward Siegler, who certainly highlighted for us that whole important global aspect of people's lives when he wrote that no amount of counselling, early childhood curricula or home visits will take the place of jobs that provide decent income, affordable housing and appropriate health care. Now, I'm sure North America is not very different from UK and Ireland in this regard, that very many of our families are having to live in situations where they don't have decent incomes, affordable housing or appropriate health care. And yet much of our service delivery is predicated that what we do in our clinics, in our uh, classrooms or wherever is going to help the child and take little or no responsibility for that wider global factor. So that does mean thinking again about how isolated or not our interventions are from other social interventions that families may well benefit from, and particularly adult persons with the impairment of autism and how their life chances can be optimized and affected. So yes, Certainly, when you look at it in terms of this domain, we're moving away from a focus on medical conditions or diagnostic categories towards high social influences and overcoming the disadvantages that people experience through their social circumstances needs well to be to the fore in how we challenge and respond to disability. Second dimension, I would say, is that we still live, certainly in an Irish context, with the notion of, oh, God love them, haven't they got a disability, but God will look after them. To one that says, you are a citizen of Ireland and you have the same rights as any other citizen of Ireland. Now, that is a big cultural shift and one that's not altogether easy to uh, acknowledge. But let me give you a little test. When you look at this picture here, what do you see? Do you see a rabbit or do you see a duck? A duck? No, no, no. You can see both. Have you been to the doctor lately? If you're... <laughs> you can see both. It's a very clever drawing, isn't it? Like the one stimulus can let us see two quite different things, yeah? Well, here's another ambiguous picture. What do you see here? Like, do you see Sam as a, a child with Down syndrome? Maybe even a touch of hydrocephaly? Certainly a child who may not be able as academically as other children. And maybe as soon as within five seconds of seeing Sam, you immediately had categorized him as Down syndrome, intellectually disabled, possibly. We need to check for autism and so on and so on. Or do you see Sam as a, like, he's a bit of a, a boisterous child. He gets on well with everyone. Seems to be a very happy child. Loves uh, soccer, loves playing baseball, softball. Like, how do you see him? Do you see him as someone who's really quite disabled, different, needs special treatments? 
or do you see him as someone who's really just like any other seven year old and deserves to be treated equally or with the same sort of experiences? Now, I may be simplifying it to say, but I imagine it's very easy for professionals, ourselves in this room, to look at that and go down the disabled category. Because after all, that's what we're trained to do. So we're, our whole uh, mindset, if you like, is to look for difference. And that's a valid enough thing, because in fact, some parents would want us to do that. In fact, the whole political structures and service structures are all created to make sure that it happens. But when the child is born into the family, my experiences from working with families the world over is that although at first they may be told their child is different, their motivating response is to treat them like any other child. And I'm sure you have heard that as well. And those parents who adopt that approach actually then ensure that the child has many more opportunities that if you like the pushy parents who always want what's best. And in many ways, it comes to the root of this uh, dimension that I'm talking about. Do you see the child as one who has the rights to be treated like any other child? Or do you see the child as someone who's different and special and has to be treated differently? And that dilemma is one that we all struggle with. So one of the ways of doing that has been to look and trying to enunciate what the rights of children, particularly those with disabilities, are. So the United Nations was to the fore in consulting with governments all over the world to create the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And then after that, they moved on to con the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And this is a quotation from the first of those two conventions, the rights of the child, where it says a mentally or physically disabled child should enjoy a full and decent life and facilitate the child's active participation in the community. So it is very much looking to the child being a citizen of the state and having the same entitlement to a full and decent life. The United States has not signed or ratified that convention, one of only seven countries in the world not to have done it, nor have they ratified the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, even though your American Disabilities Act was a driving force for the UN Convention of the Rights. Now, it's not for me to tell you why your political system has not ratified that convention, but you do stand apart from the family of nations and forsaken your leadership role that otherwise has been very much to the fore in shifting us away from a charitable to a rights perspective. And yet we still have not got that acknowledgement and the advocacy groups, in my experience, in the countries that have ratified the convention, have found that it certainly has strengthened their arm when it comes to advocating for better service provision and better supports to people so that they can have their rights respected. And sad to say, it's been parent groups and advocacy groups rather than professionals that have led those sorts of advocacy statements. So the challenge I have to leave with you is, where do you stand on that dimension? Are you with difference? Are you with equality? And that can be well enunciated in these, uh, these statements from the United Nations. So we're moving away from viewing people as helpless, different and special, to moving towards them as rights holders, deserving the same opportunities, of friendships and of employment and of education that everyone else can have. This fourth, the third dimension rather, is where we're looking no longer to necessarily segregate people with disabilities and looking to a much more inclusive society. Let me show you this diagram though. These are all the different professionals and specialists that are working with children with disabilities. And admittedly, these children, uh, this data was gathered from families 
who had children with multiple disabilities, lifelong conditions, life-threatening conditions. So they certainly needed a lot of expert care. So they were getting that through acute hospitals. They were getting it through education services, through social services provided to the wider family, and also through community health services. And each box represents a particular therapist that might be involved in that uh, service delivery. And that's a feature I would think of many other advanced affluent societies. The UK, Ireland is a rich country, just not as rich as the US admittedly, but we always like to have your dollars. If you'd like to come and visit us, we would greatly take them. Um, but you have of course invested a lot of dollars into how all these services can actually function very effectively. And don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not disparaging the contribution that this, these different disciplines have made. They certainly have improved the functioning of children and helped families. But the point is this, if you have so many of those people operating, to what extent are they working in an inclusive global way are they working on their own narrow little pathway? And if you look closely enough at that uh, figure, you will see that there are therapists like speech and language therapists or physical therapists in three or more of those domains. So instead of there not being enough therapists, there's almost a surfeit of therapists, but some of them are located in one system, another in another system. And the irony is, that they weren't even communicating with their own disciplines. So when the child left the hospital to go to community health services, they were reassessed. When they went to schools, they were reassessed again because the therapists in those systems used different assessment approaches, different intervention approaches, and they weren't communicating with each other. So they weren't even communicating within their disciplines, let alone across the disciplines. So thinking globally, you certainly then have to consider how can we there produce people who are in a much more holistic approach supporting the person and the family. Because those systems are effectively not cost efficient and certainly they perpetuate a model of provision that could well be outmoded. But let me tell you, we've certainly found it very hard to change within the existing context. And there's an old Irish saying that if you're in Ireland and you're asking directions from somewhere, say you're in Ballygo before and you want to get to Ballylumford, very often the response you'll get from the Irish person, well, if you were going there, I wouldn't start from here. Well, now you've not much option because you're already here. But you know, this is very true of how we might have to act in this particular regard. And this came home to me when I was working in countries like Africa or in terms of um, uh, Guyana in South America or in Asia, where there just weren't the opportunities to have all those different disciplines. And in Guyana, I was working with Dr. Brian O'Toole, who had set up a community-based program for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. There were very few services. He and a local physiotherapist were the only two specialists, if you like, that worked and had expertise with these families. So the way in which they approached it was as specialists, their function was not to deal with the child directly. What they did was they provided training opportunities to family members and to community members so that they could learn some of the basic ways of approaching the children and how they could help them within their community context or in their family context. Now these community volunteers, because no one was paid for this, but these community volunteers, if you like, were the frontline supporters. They were retired teachers, retired nurses. They were people who maybe had worked in business, but they were very keen. They had a heart for working and supporting their neighbors and their families. It didn't need many people because the actual proportions, like you're talking maybe two and a hundred children having a developmental uh, disability. So they didn't need big numbers of volunteers, 
But what they did as a result of bringing these people together in the training uh, context, they then supported one another and became the local committee for developing further the supports to families and people. And this was all ages and all disabilities. They weren't segregating it off by children's services, adult services. These are children with physical disabilities, etc. It was holistic, it was global, because at a local level, you needed to do that. You couldn't have the big metropolises like um, uh, Austin that were, you could have all these specialisms. And what they found was how big an impact that then made not just on the children and personal development and their inclusion, but also in how the life circumstances of those families got transformed. The, the, the mothers, because very often the mothers were still the primary caregivers, but they also were also the job income generators. So the women started to get employment, the, the kids started to go to school and got education, and they, some of those, also went on to get paid employment, all generated within their community context and partnerships. And it brought home to me certainly the truth that uh, Henry Ford said, that as everyone is moving forward together, the community and families, as well as specialists like ourselves, then success does take care of itself. Sometimes I feel we try to micromanage development when really what development, what fuels development very often is the opportunities that you provide people with and they make their own leaps, their own developmental progress. Now that might be overly optimistic, but my point is a simple one. If people aren't given opportunities, then they often don't develop. So bear that one in mind when you come to think about your setting and your services and how we might therefore move away from a focus just on therapy and treatments, not deriding them, they have a place and they have a role, but remembering that the global context needs to be one in which we need partnerships if we are going to really create the sorts of opportunities that people need and grow from. And what about this last one? Well, it's very easy, and certainly in my country anyway, it's very easy for people to say, but I'm an ABA therapist and I'm only responsible for the children who live in Belfast. I don't really have any, it doesn't really concern me what happens in other parts of Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland is a very small place. Indeed, when we've evaluated some of the innovative projects related to autism in Northern Ireland that have been developed in one part of the region, and we've said to people in other parts of the region, why aren't you doing what other people are doing here? Um, because, and Northern Ireland isn't a nation by any means, but at, an, at another national level, if there's good practice in one place, surely it deserves to be replicated. And their answer very often is a blasé. Well, either, well, we do things differently here and we don't do what other people necessarily do. Or else their answer is, well, it wouldn't really work here, which really is subtext for, I don't want to make it work here because it's not my responsibility. So how do we shift our perspective from just thinking that our responsibility is only limited to certain individuals in a certain location? Well, it probably means that we need to not only appreciate that what influences our practice is not just the needs of the child, but the way in which families interact with us and the child, the way in which the community is prepared to interact with families and prepared to interact with the child, but also and crucially, how society and culture also influences community, family, and so on. And no doubt Sandy's going to say a lot more about those influences and how we should be alert to them and be global, having our mindset globally focused to embrace the diversity that can be there. But just to remind you, the way society does influence the way you operate is because of the laws and conditions that it lays down, its policies around who gets funding for services, who doesn't get funding, when does funding stop? You may well get it in my country while you're a child, 
But as soon as you become an adult, then all that funding disappears. That's not something you can decide. That's decided by the policies. And the way funding is allocated, for example, when autism started to increase in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, the government didn't put in new money. It took the money out of intellectual disabilities provision and put it into autism provision and said, we have solved autism because we've put more money into autism. Intellectual disability was bereft. So it was uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul, a common expression. And of course, your regulatory bodies are often doing reviews to accredit the, the work that you are doing. And those reviews are designed in many instances to maintain the system that already exists rather than to influence the way systems can change. So the danger is we get trapped in a review or accreditation systems that reinforce old practices in the language that I'm now using, rather than point us in the direction of new practices. Now, those are all things you're at the mercy of. So the society does have a big influence on in the way you work, and your responsibility as an agent of change, I would argue, is not just to the child, to the family, and to the community, but to the society. How much are you educating the Texan society about the changed perspectives of high disability and high existing laws, policies, funding, and accreditation procedures are not being effective? But you're not helpless by any means because you equally have a way of influencing society and all the individuals, the advocates, the self-advocates, the family, the communities can also produce the plans that they would like to see um, implemented, the changes that they feel are necessary. You can lobby. And I happened to visit the Capitol building um, as, uh, when I arrived yesterday. And as I was in the the, the um, dome area, I heard one person go up to a gentleman and say, Senator, congratulations on your re-election. It's great to have you elected again. And of course, he didn't mean anything to me. He just looked like another tourist, to be truthful. But had I but known, I could have invited him to come to this seminar so that he could hear a little bit more about what was going on. Of course, you can use the media. The media have been a great source of change like the whole campaign in Ireland for a gay marriage, for example, which was um, a more recent rights issue that was tackled, was very much driven by media profiles based on rights and quality of life and so on. And then it comes to election time for your House of Representatives and for your senators, then this is a good opportunity to start lobbying them for what goes into their manifesto and what needs to change. And it needn't be a party political issue, this is a cross-party issue. You need to influence, in our experience, all the political parties to let them understand and see things. So hence, we then move not just from seeing ourselves as local operatives, but actually trying to develop uh, and moving away from seeing people as devalued to emphasizing how much they are valued as citizens of our country. And that therefore means that we have to change our perception of our role. But to go back to what I said about the whole polio epidemic and the way in which a generation has shifted perceptions, that is our contribution. That's our investment for the future. That we're not stuck or defined by history and our past, but we have the competence and we mobilize our creativity in order to bring about change. So what does all this mean? Well, I was fortunate to spend some time in Australia in the first three months of this year. Uh, I think the term is snowbird in North America, where you leave the cold northern hemisphere and you come down to the warmth of Australia, which is what I did. I have a son living there and I was able to join in the family life and enjoy uh, Australian sunshine and hospitality. And you know, the Aboriginal people of Australia and uh, at the beginning of today's um, uh, events, uh, Tina did acknowledge how you also have your own indigenous Indian people 
and how we're living on their lands and on their territory. And so too, it is in Australia. And there was an art exhibition I went to, and this is a painting that uh, really spoke to me because they were trying to communicate what it means to be healthy in an Aboriginal context. Now, this is the wisdom of generations and generations past we're talking about here. This was the way in which they interpret health in a much more, less individualistic way, in a much more cooperative way. And you get this in African culture quite a bit. So in an African culture, it would be expressed as, my, I can only be as healthy as you are healthy. So if in my society, in my community, someone's health is poor, then my health is also poorer. If someone in my community is disabled, then I also am disabled. It is not just a feature of the individual. And the artists in this painting went on to say this, we are strong in our health when we are standing in our country and with our family. So are you standing with your country and with your family and making people with autism welcomed as citizens of Texas, of the United States, and of the global economy. But remember too what Einstein told us, that what you got to where you are will not get you to where you need to be. So more of the same is not the way to transform. Rather, we have to go back to our creative roots and you already, I suspect, are doing that, but you don't realize the context in which you're making it happen. But when you work an ally with others, other disciplines, other systems, other cultures, then you begin to realize just what human beings can do. And I was very struck when we had a presentation this morning using the University of Texas and the byline in their PowerPoint presentation said, this university has as its motto, what starts here changes the world. I hope you can live up to that particular motto. Thank you.